<laughs> Welcome everybody to the 2018 Whittemore Lecture. I'm uh, Jonathan Overpeck. I'm the Samuel A. Graham Dean of the School uh, for Environment and Sustainability. And this is my first Whittemore Lecture. Um, and I'm very happy to be able to introduce the lecture and introduce the speakers uh, we're really lucky to have here uh, today. Um, and I am here on the behalf of the Landscape Architecture Program in SEAS, one of the real vital components of this very interdisciplinary school. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to begin with a few words about the lecture and who it's named after, and then an overview of what the program is and introduction to our panelists, our speakers for today. Um, Professor Harlow Whittemore was a nationally recognized leader in landscape architecture and community planning. Um, he received his master's degree in landscape design here at Michigan in 1914, over 100 years ago, and then he immediately joined the faculty. He was good. <laughs> Professor Whittemore taught and served as chair of the Department of Landscape Architecture and City Planning until his retirement in 1958. In addition to his prominent role at the University of Michigan, he was instrumental in developing the concept for the Huron-Clinton Metro Park Authority. The Harlow O. Whittemore Lecture Series at SEAS, School for Environment and Sustainability, was established in 1977. The endowment fund for the Whittemore Lecture was created with gifts from many of the professor, uh, professor's family, friends, and former students. And we thank them for their continued support of the lecture. And now, next, it's my pleasure to introduce our speakers. Jennifer Dowdell, um, Jennifer Misset, and Tom Soser. Tom is the director of the Baltimore City Department of Planning. While Jennifer Dowdell, Dowdell, an ecological designer, and Jennifer Masset, an environmental engineer, are part of Biohabitats, a design studio specializing in conservation planning, ecological restoration, and regenerative demand, uh, design. Regenerative design. This is a climate scientist, I apologize. <laughs> Um, in a way that exemplifies the possibilities for transdisciplinary work and community engagement, this school is all about that, these panelists work together to lead the development of a citywide green network plan for Baltimore. The plan integrated ecology into open space planning to produce, quote, a bold vision for reimagining vacant and abandoned properties and transforming them into community assets, unquote. Sounds familiar, what we need here in Michigan. Before we ask them to tell you about their transdisciplinary process to produce the Baltimore Green Network Plan, I want to tell you a little more about each of our speakers. Jennifer Dowdwell, Dowdell, I apologize, it's a tongue twister. Jennifer Dowdwell, I want to put a W in there, is a 2007 Masters of Landscape Architecture graduate of SNRE SEAS. So it's really great to have you back. Uh, she is project manager and landscape ecological designer and planner for biohabitats, where her work integrates landscape ecology with innovative stormwater and natural resource management. Jennifer has been part of the teaching faculty at the Omega Center for Sustainable Living's Ecological Literacy and Immersion Program, as well as a guest lecturer at Columbia University. Jennifer Massette is a bioregion team leader and senior water resources engineer for biohabitats. She works to integrate green infrastructure, urban ecology, and ecological restoration measures 
into urban waterfronts and redevelopment projects. She co-authored a national guidance manual on retrofitting urban areas with green infrastructure and was on the project teams that developed many local and state stormwater manuals as well as national guidance for the US EPA related to green infrastructure, stormwater management, and watershed re restoration. Before joining, joining Biohabitats, Jennifer was program director at the Center for Watershed Protection. Tom Stoser is director of the Baltimore City Department of Planning, where he's worked for 18 years in roles like community planner, strategic planner, comprehensive planner, and manager of the city's capital improvement program. In 2007, Tom joined Baltimore's mayoral staff as assistant deputy mayor for neighborhood and economic development. Tom oversaw the Department of Public Works, the Department of Recreation and Parks, the Parking Authority. Most importantly, he played a key role in shaping the city's green agenda, creating Baltimore's Office of Sustainability, and appointing the city's new Commission on Sustainability. So I'm very excited to hear more about what this team has created in the Green Network Plan, and I'm sure we'll all have much to learn. Please join me in welcoming Jennifer, Jennifer, and Tom for the 2018 Whittemore Lecture. Thank you very much, Dean. Um, it's great to be here, and I, I really want to give a, a very special thank you to Joan, who's been an uh, amazing host here and uh, just a wonderful person to spend time with. So I uh, really feel privileged about that. This is my first um, foray, actually, into Ann Arbor and Detroit, so it's, it's been a great learning experience for me as well. Um, and I, just a little bit about the planning department, we have 50 planners on staff, and we have five different divisions within the planning department, including land use and urban design, research and strategic planning, comprehensive planning, um, historic preservation planning, as well as the Office of Sustainability. So, and across that, we um, staff three different commissions. The Planning Commission, the Preservation Commission, and the Sustainability Commission. So there's a, a lot going on with all of that. And I'm excited here to give you some background on kind of the origins of the Green Network Plan and some of the challenges that we have to face and how this plan hopefully is going to get us there. Uh, and then we'll turn it over to the two Jennifers to give you a little more specifics about how. Uh, their analysis and, and their team really came together uh, to, to help us formulate the plan. And then I'll give you some highlights about some of the recommendations and pilot projects that are about to take place. So first off, um, location map always is helpful if folks are not too familiar with where Baltimore is located. We're on the eastern seaboard about 45 miles north of Washington, D.C., and maybe an hour and a half by car south of Philadelphia. So in a great strategic location that, uh, you know, is, is on the booming east coast. Um, I'm not a city historian, but I'll just give you a little profile and context for the city. Um, it really started as, you know, a little outpost uh, back in the mid-1700s and started developing mainly as a port city uh, throughout the 1800s. Uh, really started getting more of an in industrial kind of background and lots of great institutions including places like Johns Hopkins University and the Enoch Pratt Library System, and uh, grew into a, a major commercial and business center as well uh, into the 1900s. Um, 
in the 50s, we were sort of this mix of an old port and uh, kind of a downtown central business district. And uh, we were hitting our peak in population and jobs and all of those pieces at that time. Um, but soon after that, uh, fortunes changed, economic restructuring happened, and uh, we, you know, really had to adapt. So today, this is a, a little sort of our million dollar shot of uh, the inner harbor of Baltimore uh, that has been a tremendous economic engine for the city. Uh, it has cultural attractions. It's been a place where businesses really want to locate and more and more and more residential as well, uh, which is, is a fabulous combination. Um, during the, our history, we've had the good fortune to have the Olmsted brothers uh, develop a comprehensive greening and, and landscape vision for the city. And it follows our major stream valleys uh, in Baltimore. And some of the big estates were converted over time into major city parks. And uh, two of the big ones here you see are Druid Hill Park, uh, on the west side and Clifton Park on the east side. Um, a little data background on where we are as a city. So we, our population's about 620,000 and we're in a metro area of 2.7 million. Uh, but there's, there's a lot of contrast between the city and the rest of the metro area in terms, for instance, like race, uh, Baltimore has, city has 63% African American population, contrast with 62% white population in the surrounding region. Uh, we have, so about a 30% white population, 64% African American, and then a, a small mixture of other races and ethnic groups. Um, our housing stock, we have just about double the amount of per census count vacant properties, unoccupied buildings than the average throughout the, the region. And we, our poverty level is at 22% compared to the overall region of 10%. So we have a very significant concentration of uh, poor population in the city and everything that comes with that, food deserts and low property values and lots of different challenges. And our median income is, is basically half of the median. So a little bit of a tough situation, but not unfamiliar to those of you who uh, know Detroit. Uh, this is just another graphic that kind of depicts some of that. Uh, Light green bar is Baltimore City's population, and we were made up about uh, three quarters of the entire region's population back in 1950. And you can see how our light green bar has steadily shrunk, and the dark green bar has gotten bigger and bigger and bigger. And you know, that's just not population numbers, that's also political influence, representation in state government, and all those other pieces. Uh, means that there's been a, a tremendous shift of, of power and influence away from Baltimore and towards other s jurisdictions in the region. Uh, Employment-wise, same sort of scenario, a little maybe slightly less drastic. Of we, we had about half the jobs in the region back in 1970, and maybe now we're at about 20, 24 percent of the jobs in the entire region. Um, within the city itself, we experienced decades of, of declining employment, but in recent years, our jobs has st stabilized and started to grow, which is exciting news. Uh, also, this probably isn't an easy slide to read, but the point of it is that uh, since 2010, we've had quite a housing boom in particular areas in the city, downtown and the waterfront being a, a huge part of that. So we've had over 
20,000 new housing units constructed within the city limits since 2010. Uh, and there's, there's more on the way. Much of that has been market rate apartments and a lot of millennials coming to the city plus empty nesters. Uh, but these are very expensive, uh, tend to be very expensive apartments that not people, normal folks in Baltimore with their average incomes of half the region can't take advantage of these kinds of places. Uh, we are a city of neighborhoods. We're about 80 to 85 square miles, but within there, lots of defined neighborhoods with uh, distinct character. Um, this represents 270 separate neighborhood areas, and this, these are uh, sort of depicted as places where we collect census data. They're neighborhood statistical areas. Uh, but beyond these 270 boundaries that are kind of official, we have well over 800 different community organizations from block clubs to umbrella groups to citywide nonprofits. Uh, so a lot of organizations of varying capacities. Um, this map displays our housing market typology. And so we, this is, we're updating it now. This is from 2014. Every three years we refresh this data and refresh this map. Um, and it considers uh, variables such as uh, sales prices of houses, uh, owner versus renter, time on the market, number of foreclosures, a whole bunch of housing and real estate related data, and then does what's called a cluster of analysis to group like areas together. And there's uh, six or seven different categories. The areas that are blue and purple are the strongest markets. And I don't know how well this will show up, but you can see along the waterfront, very strong markets, and then up through kind of the central core of the city with some strength and a lot of more middle income are the lighter blue and yellow. And then the orange areas are the areas with the most vacant and abandoned property and the most uh, distressed housing markets. So we use this in uh, collaboration with the City Housing and Community Development Agency and with nonprofits and CDCs to help us figure out how to target strategies. This goes down to the uh, census block group level. So it can be pretty fine grained when you kind of drill down and there, Baltimore is known for being the kind of place that can change almost block to block depending on specific conditions and what streets are in proximity and, and all of that. So uh, we, we use it in, in a number of ways. For instance, in the more middle income areas, we prioritize where housing code enforcement might happen so that if there are just a few vacant properties, we can you know, really focus on those and try to get them back into the market before that kind of uh, typology spreads. Um, here's the uh, real challenging map that keeps me up at night. Uh, and that's our, our vacant lots and vacant buildings. There's 30,000 dots on this map. Uh, the red being the vacant buildings and the orange being vacant lots. Um, out of these 30,000, the city owns 20 to 25 percent of them. So the vast majority are in private hands, which creates a, a challenge as well. And unlike um, Detroit, we do not have a land bank that's set up specifically to deal with this. So it's been talked about and explored and over the years, but it's never come to fruition as of yet. I, I'm still holding out hope, but we'll, we'll see. Um, to deal with all those vacant and abandoned properties, there's been a number of initiatives. Uh, the probably most famous one is our Vacants to Value that looks at 
streamlining sales uh, processes to get publicly owned land into private hands, layering incentives, that code enforcement, strategic blight elimination, trying to get we strive to get whole block outcomes and not just do a bunch of missing teeth because we are a row house neighborhood, you can see from here. So even with all those dots that look amazingly uh, magnified in terms of how much vacancy there is, in very few instances is there a whole block completely vacant. So there, if there's 20 or 30 houses on a street, um, you may have 25 of them vacant, and five of them are often scattered within that block occupied. And so if you want to take down that block as a city, you have to exercise some eminent domain authority, relocate those owners and, and renters who are in those properties. Uh, it's done according to federal standards, and it always puts the person you're moving in a much better situation. They get to choose where they go. Um, some of these houses may only be worth five or $10,000 in the current condition, but to relocate them according to federal standards and keep them uh, in, a, in an equivalent sort of situation, but in a better neighborhood, more stable area, we often pay 150, 175,000 to relocate that person, to free up that house so that we can go after it. And we, you have to do that on an individual basis. Um, we also, as a, an agency, our sustainability group, to deal with the aftermath of demolition, we developed a green pattern book with a bunch of stakeholders to show different ways that uh, vacant land could be treated and came up with a number of typologies from community gardens to uh, neighborhood parks and urban farms and even things like green parking and stormwater management. So this served, we developed this about five or six years ago, served as kind of a resource guide for community groups who, who wanted to take on some of these challenges. Uh, we do have a very active Adopt-A-Lot program in the city uh, that if there's a city-owned lot that doesn't have another use for it, communities can, can sign up and sort of sign a lease agreement to adopt that lot, but they have to maintain it. Um, also, what we did to help uh, sort of spur more interest in what we could do beyond just a lot-by-lot lot approach was uh, created a design competition with our Department of Public Works and with the Chesapeake Bay Trust, uh, a major funder in the area, and we selected about half a dozen more significant city-owned vacant sites and had a competition where communities could apply to uh, sort of do a treatment to those areas, but we matched those communities up with professional firms, landscape architects and civil engineers and designers to come up with proposals that could really possibly be transformative. And we funded half a dozen of those, and here's a few before and after pictures of lots that really were just kind of scarred and ugly, um, vacant lots, and creating places with public art and stormwater management has been a key part of all of this. Um, places for community gathering and attractive plantings. Um, and we, that was just a, a quick profile of that. Now, getting into the sort of the meat of what kind of launched the Green Network, this map depicts our kind of legacy um, green system, green network system in the city. Uh, you can see major parks, and thanks to the Olmsteads, it's a, a really great uh, system we have. Uh, they're often connected by boulevards as well that are tree-lined and historic. Uh, many of the parks follow the stream systems uh, that come into the city. There's the Herring Run on the east, the Jones Falls centrally, and the Gwynns Falls on the west, and it all drains into the Inner Harbor at the bottom. Uh, and we also have, uh, at least in parts of the city, a fairly generous tree canopy. 
Uh, we, we have a Tree Baltimore program, and I think we're at about a 25, 26% tree cover. <coughs> Our goal is to get to 40%. Um, so, you know, this is sort of the base of what we had to work on. And then when you layer on those vacant and abandoned properties, you see they are specifically more, more or less the concentrations of them are in areas that don't have a lot of that green infrastructure. So this uh, really in the minds of several of us who kind of birthed this project was a real opportunity to talk about improving the quality of life and targeting what resources we did have available, which had, were not immense, but to do what we could in a strategic way to start to transform some of these really, really struggling neighborhoods. And a couple of factors that played into that specifically, and I guess I'll, here's a map that shows them both kind of together. Um, we had, uh, demolition has been something we've needed to do and blight elimination in the city for a long time now with that 50 year plus decline in population. But our budget for that has never been very robust. Uh, and a few years ago, a uh, former mayor um, did a financial restructuring for the city and made a commitment out of that restructuring to raise our demolition dollars, our local demolition dollars, from two and a half million a year to 10 million a year. Still a relative drop in the bucket, but a huge increase to start to work from. And at about that same time, um, there were mandates coming down from the federal government and the state to uh, address stormwater issues and impervious surface challenges and water quality in a big way. And as a result of that, it was a very politicized process, but we got a stormwater fee passed in the city. And that is now into its maybe third or fourth year of existence, and it's generating 25 to $30 million a year as a new fund source that wasn't there before. So those were two pieces that uh, made me personally think we were in a position to maybe take a bolder approach to all of this and had some funding streams available. So that kind of was, was really the big impetus on my part for that. And I think most of you here probably know the benefits of green infrastructure and there's so many opportunities to tie things together, everything from neighborhood walkability and quality of life and heat island effect and you know mental health benefits include, but also things like crime and safety and just taking down blighted properties and replacing them with some kind of green that's going to be maintained is just a, you know, sort of a, a baseline simple thing, but it can really, I think, start to be a game changer. And if it's done in a way that uh, creates a blueprint to do this across the city in different areas and tries to get city agencies coordinated on it, funders coordinated on it, nonprofits, the real estate and development community, it can start to maybe really turn the ship around. Um, and here's a set of slides, and I have to give credit on this to uh, Air St. Gross architecture firm in Baltimore who put them together, but just kind of show uh, a set of visualizing what this green network could look like at maybe a, a neighborhood scale. So the area that's outlined in white uh, is right along the Amtrak line that comes into Baltimore from Philadelphia and New York. And it was, it's an area that is very pockmarked with all sorts of different vacancy. Um, right after uh, this area, it goes into a tunnel and goes to Penn Station downtown. Uh, but there's all sorts of vacant houses and existing vacant properties in that area. And so we, as just kind of a tool to illustrate the potential of this, you see what kind of 
transformation at a large scale could happen in terms of urban farms and plazas and some reforestation and tree buffers. And uh, it, it could really, if you could imagine spreading this kind of network in strategically swaths of where there doesn't exist green infrastructure today, I, I think it could be a very powerful thing that um, can also generate jobs for farming and maintenance, deconstruction, that's something we really do a lot in Baltimore and are trying to scale up where we don't just do straight demo, but you actually reclaim the materials from fireplace mantle, mantles to all the bricks and wood and everything else. And it's actually, those items are, are in very, very high demand. And we just opened a nonprofit retail store where that's for sale to anybody who wants to, to buy these kinds of materials for their own projects. Um, Let's see. One of the other pieces, and I don't know if I, my timing is getting off here, so I'm going to try to tighten it up a little. But um, I, the team will describe uh, their subs and, and what they do in a lot more detail. But this vision was something we had to pitch to our uh, finance department and mayor's office to get some resources to do a project <coughs> at this scale. And uh, we were fortunate enough to get a $200,000 uh, special allocation to do this big planning project and be able to hire the consultants. Briefly, we set up a structure that includes uh, residents and community representation as part of a leadership team that brings together a whole bunch of partners uh, that I mentioned, city agencies, nonprofits, philanthropy, real estate. Um, we set up a specific city agency work group to work through all the coordination that needs to happen because everybody's doing their mandates in their silos and it's really hard to kind of step back for everybody and see how their different resources can work together for a bigger outcome than if they do it all separately. Uh, we set up various advisory committees and we also, in the department, in addition to hiring the consultant team, we really, we knew we have to do, we can't just do a vision plan, we have to do something that's going to be implementable as soon as possible because there's very little patience for more plans. Uh, we have done a lot of plans both in the city and outside groups and unless you can show some real momentum on that, uh, it gets discouraging quickly. And um, So outreach and engagement, land use and design, funding and financing and specifically implementation. We set up subgroups to work with our staff and with stakeholders to, to set strategies around all of them. Here's a quick profile of logos of all the partners we've engaged in this process. And we have also made a point to align it with other planning processes that are going on in the city. There's neighborhood plans, uh, commercial corridor plans. So we're, all of those can sort of feed off of each other. And uh, where there's greening opportunities in a corridor or in a neighborhood, they can become part of the green network plan and where the Green Network plan wants to influence an area, they can become one of these neighborhood plans and you can get some different resources at play there. So, and we also designed a sort of catchy graphic, a fun <coughs> graphic to talk about how this can not only green spaces, but is also about connecting neighborhoods through those stream valley trails, through bike trails, even uh, specific uh, landscape corridors. So with that, uh, sort of setting the stage, maybe a little long-winded, I'm going to now turn it over to the Biohabitats team. Thanks, Tom. Good evening. I'm Jennifer Massette. I am the engineer on the team, um, not Jennifer Dowdell, who is the landscape architect and the alum. But um, I just wanted to spend a few minutes to introduce you to the process and some of the key considerations for developing the Green Network Plan. And I should say, first of all, thank you for inviting us to be here. And thank you, Joan, for the last two days. It's really been a fascinating exchange, I think, of ideas and information. 
So again, introduce you to the overall process and, and some of the, the key considerations when we developed this. But I think first, um, what we started off with was developing the vision and the goals for the Green Network Plan. This is the very first step of the process. The vision that was developed in conjunction with Department of Planning as well as several stakeholders was that the Green Network Vision Plan would be a bold and implementable plan for an urban green network that connects and supports the <coughs> residents of the city of Baltimore and creates a system of healthy, vibrant, and resilient places. To accompany the vision, we developed three key goals. The first goal was to protect and enhance the unique ecological resources of our city. The second was to support economic growth and sustainable redevelopment of vacant lands across the city. And the third was to improve the quality of life of re city residents and strengthen the social fabric of our community. Um, pretty, pretty challenging goals to achieve. <coughs> One thing I want to point out is they are led by, these goals are led by ecology. The first goal, protect and enhance the unique ecological resources of the city. The other key things that we, one of the key things we recognized from the very beginning was that to develop this plan, you really needed a team that was interdisciplinary. Um, it could not be achieved by a small group of people. It would require a much larger group of people with a lot of different areas of expertise and experience and, and input. So at the beginning, we crafted, we responded to the RFP. I work with biohabitats. We responded to the RFP that the city um, put out, Department of Planning put out, and we put together a team that consisted of biohabitats as the prime consultant as well as four subconsultants. Biohabitats is a consulting firm that focuses exclusively on conservation planning, ecological restoration, and regenerative design. Our entire team is either, our team consists of landscape architects, engineers, and scientists. And we stay very, very focused on ecology and the work that we do. Um, we are also Baltimore based and headquartered in Baltimore. We brought on four team members, a um, pretty wide ar array of expertise and experience, the first being Flora T, their landscape architects, who are experts on open space and park planning and design, Living Design Lab, who are urban planners and architects, Tool Design Group, which are transportation planners, and Advanced Placemaking, which are economic development consultants. So really try to capture, again, a wide array of, array of disciplines. And I think the other thing that was important to us about putting together this team was that the team knows Baltimore. So four of these five firms are headquartered in Baltimore. It's our backyard. And we all, not only are we doing this for work, but we live there and have a lot of, in, a lot of investment in Baltimore and, and really care about the outcome of this Green Network plan. Now the key consideration was our approach. We recognized long Department of Planning that to be successful in this endeavor, we'd have to do have a robust data analysis process, while at the same time having fairly very extensive community engagement. And that they had to be an iterative process and they would feed into each other, where the data analysis and the community engagement ran really in a parallel track, fed in, and then fed into interpretation and collaboration by not only the consulting team, but really by the Department of Planning. I think my experience with this process has been that our consulting team has been almost an extension and augmentation to the expertise within the Department of Planning. We've worked together very closely throughout this process to develop the Green Network Plan. So the overall approach, um, which Jennifer Dowdell will talk about in more detail, was to first conduct a site suitability, which was to identify the vacant lands within the city that are most suitable to be integrated into the Green Network. Then taking those sites that were identified as being suitable, we went through a prioritization process to identify the priority parcels that should be part of the Green Network Plan. And from that, then from there, that led into developing the Green Network Plan itself. At the same time, there was a constant feedback loop with a variety of stakeholders. The leadership team, which, is con which was made up of really leaders of both city agencies as well as nonprofits and other stakeholder groups, uh, state agencies, federal agencies, um, the advisory team, which is made up of the staff level, staff level of um, those same agencies and nonprofits, as well as community feedback and community engagement. I can't even begin to guess how many meetings took place, not just large public meetings, but individual meetings with, with one of the many, many community groups throughout the city. Um, and that eventually fed into the planning pro the plan that Jennifer will talk about in more detail. Data analysis, again, robust data analysis. There was a lot of data available. Um, and this is, 
I know there's no way you can read this graphic. It's really just to illustrate the amount of data, but what it, what it, what it shows are the different categories of data that we looked at, including data related to ecology and natural resources, as well as transportation and circulation, uh, as well as social spaces, economy, vacant lands, and history within the city. And then the colored lines indicate at what point in the process that data was used. So some of it was used to identify the existing green network, some of it was used to identify the legacy green network that Jennifer will tell you more about, the sites, site suitability to identify the sites that were priorities for being incorporated into the network, and then finally to develop the vision plan itself. So there was a very robust data analysis that again, happened parallel to this community engagement process, where again, there were a number of citywide meetings, as well as geographically focused meetings within the focus areas, as well as just one-on-one -on -one meetings with community groups or churches, um, through, really throughout the city over the course of, we've been working on this for two years, so this has been going on for a couple of years now. And these are not meetings where we just went and stood up there and gave presentations. There were a lot of activities where we tried very hard to get input from community members, where we'd have them actually sketch out and draw out their ideas for a green network plan. We had them identify the green, existing green spaces in the city that are important to them that they wanted to maintain or enhance. We also had them identify areas they were concerned about, areas that were problems in their neighborhoods so that they would like to see changed. Um, used a lot of that data and actually fed it into GIS and used that as part of our analysis process. And as the team went ahead and took that data in, into the interpretation and collaboration, process where, again, very iterative, but we did, I think, make good use of the community engagement data that we received. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jennifer to talk in more detail about the analysis. Thanks, Jen. Thanks to all of you for being here. It's very exciting to be back at Michigan. I'm very excited to, to share a little bit more about the process, the sort of nitty gritty of the analysis. A lot of this will be familiar to some of you. Um, based on your work here, I'm sure. So the analysis. Uh, one of the, I think, most important sort of stepping back, what Biohabitats really envisioned when we approached this RFP and looking at this as a, a problem-solving exercise was thinking of how can we look at the Baltimore Green Network as part of a much larger ecological network? What are the potential regional implications of whatever we do when we start focusing in on the city of Baltimore? So this is just a, a map of the mapped green infrastructure hubs and corridors for the state of Maryland. So we wanted to know, when we dove into this project in Baltimore City, how were we going to potentially connect to and strengthen connections to existing green infrastructure around the region? And how could we tie into that to enhance the experience of community members in experiencing the green network as it continues to evolve within the city of Baltimore? So as we started thinking about the analysis and the, the pieces that help define the city of Baltimore and the natural resources and ecology that helps define the city, hydrology, the water, the story of water was key to the experience of Baltimore. It, as Tom mentioned earlier, um, we are a city that is defined by streams, stream quarters that run through the city. Now, many of them have been piped to some degree at this point in time, but the forms, the patterns of the landscape that help define this, this city are part of what also defined and created these stream corridors that then empty into the Inner Harbor and empty out into and connect to the much larger and very important kind of economic engine and cultural um, identification of the Chesapeake Bay in this area of the country. So it, water is dear to us and it's not always visible but it is a, a sure part of the ecology and the streams and the corridors along those streams, the forests are very important to defining our identity here. So we wanted to have that as our foundation as we started thinking about everything from quality of life to transitions and connections across the city. But we also took a step back and looked at much of the data that Tom referenced earlier with regard to historical patterns of development and planning, open space creation, um, this beautiful plan by the Olmsted brothers, and then the historical implications and the legacy of past planning and past um, different types of decisions that have been made across the city, like redlining, that sort of divided our city communities in some ways and, and made it harder for some communities to succeed um, into the future. 
But at the core of this, of course, is this idea of looking at these vacant lots as the point of departure. And how do we start to think of the vacancy as the opportunity for growing and creating a new and vibrant and really a strong green network that connects across the city and creates more spaces of, of green and open space for people. How, where we started in site analysis, in the suitability, the first step of our analysis, was really looking at what we considered legacy green network and existing green network as it is today. And Tom showed that existing green network map, uh, sort of the mapped resources that we have of the city. But we took a step back and we wanted to look at the, the legacy green network. And we defined that based on the existing data available as historic streams, and that's on the left here, um, which you can see a little bit of the historic streams as well as floodplain, um, where we could find some native soil still available, and, and existing park and open space areas. What we did is we started to look at the overlay and the relationship between the existing, which is in green on this side, and the legacy, which is the light blue. So you start to see there are all these legacy streams that are no longer available as streams. They're all piped now. Um, but how could we start to look at the patterns of these existing resources as we look to recreate or re-envision what is today's green network for the city? So in the first step of analysis, we were really thinking of site suitability, as Jen mentioned. So we were looking at the relationships between the vacant lots, this legacy green network, this rich story of water and hydrology across the city and the natural systems associated with that hydrology, and then today's existing green network, which is really about the park systems that exist along the stream valleys, as well as community managed open space, urban farms, which we do have several already. And how do we look at those together to start to develop where are the most suitable sites to focus our efforts on understanding what the, the green network becomes as it moves into the future? So we did the site suitability and the heat map here is the result of that, where we started to see the, the highest opportunities for starting to drill down to create the green network and really start to enhance a robust um, area of open space in areas that don't have much access to open space. From that site suitability map and working with the city to understand communities that were already very active in, in thinking about the future of their neighborhoods and revitalization opportunities. Four focus areas were identified across the city, um, three here on the west and one here on the east, that highlighted those neighborhoods, and in many of these maps we've already seen, that's where the concentration of the, the stress on the housing market is, and it is where the highest vacancies were, and they were also identified as the opportunities where we could start to look at the green network. So those four focus areas, the city planning department went even further and started um, more detailed conversation with those communities. And, and Tom's going to go into this in a little bit greater detail at the end of this discussion um, to really start to think of how can we start to formulate pilot projects, working with the community, engaging with them, and getting their ideas of what they desire in their community to really make this plan vibrant and living beyond just a vision. So as, as we continued through the site suitability analysis, we looked at further layers of data, both in terms of existing data and historic data, and we also looked at quality of life variables, as Jen mentioned in that very complicated data chart. Then we also included the GIS, so we threw out all those community engagement public meetings, people were marking up maps, and then all of that was entered into GIS. And we were able to use that data and, and really let that also drive how we started to look for the suitable locations for connections and corridors for a new, this green network, and also um, past research that's been done throughout the city by the Baltimore Ecosystem Study and other researchers for opportunities for things like improving and increasing tree canopy and where were the highest and best needs for that to see how all of this overlays to help us create the green network. Moving from site suitability, we moved into our prioritization process. So we had an idea of all the locations possible for the green network and we had those four focus areas where we knew we would start to look at pilot projects but we also needed to really knit everything together. So in the next step of the analysis, we did much more of the kind of gap analysis or least cost path analysis, these different GIS analyses, really thinking about these ecological questions of consideration and connections 
um, between patches and corridors. We looked at everything from these inspired school areas, locations in the city where there's been an identification of a neat, um, the schools are going to be there and how can we enhance the communities around those schools. We looked at opportunities for um, filling in what we identified as habitat deserts through GIS analysis, uh, opportunities to enhance stream and forest buffers to really enhance the ecological function of the existing resources. And then also looked at different opportunities for connective tissue across the city, whether for people or for even birds or other types of wildlife <coughs> that might be moving across the city and through these ecological systems. And lastly, we looked at other existing studies that helped us understand the, the potential for people to move through. Because this isn't just about nature, it is a city with a community that needed access and a, a feeling of comfort and safety. So we looked at one study in particular, for example, was a low traffic stress study that identified the streets that would have um, the slower traffic, perhaps less of the larger <coughs> vehicles on those roads to un understand and identify those streets we could start to identify as part of our connective trail and sidewalk and system across the city. So now into the results, the good stuff. The green network as it came together. So we, as we organized all that data and started to see these patterns appear, we had uh, numerous feedback opportunities with community members and, and a lot of questions and answers with the city planning staff to really sort out and organize this into a network. And this is building on, of course, the existing network of open space and green space that is across Baltimore City. But we organized the green network plan into a series of nodes and corridors. And the nodes were those destinations or activity centers. They might be open space or parks, community gardens, but they could also be habitat and, and other safe spaces. And then the corridors are the linear spaces that provide a safe and comfortable movement within and between nodes and neighborhoods for both humans and wildlife. So for the nodes and corridors, we um, had three sort of levels of corridors, those that we identified as people corridors, those that we identified more as parkway corridors, and those that we identified as nature corridors. And part of this, breaking this into these different levels was, and categories was for us to help also start to define what does that mean on the ground as we move this towards potential implementation. We want to define how we start to apply this in the city in terms of design considerations and, and what it's going to feel like for, for use. So first, the people corridors, a key part of the plan, really how do we connect across the city? So different typologies of streetscape design and trail access. And one corridor that you'll see that's a little bit darker um, it, that goes around the entire city that Tom will also talk a little bit about is this rails to trails, a sort of former railroad um, connected corridor that encircles the city in a loop and also becomes a sort of hub from which a lot of different trails move off of. Then there are the parkway corridors, and part of this is the legacy of the Olmsted plan and some of the original sort of parkway-esque roads. And this is less about um, necessarily sort of bike access in all cases, but more about how do we look at some of the streetscapes and old parkways to increase urban tree canopy, to an increase the sort of green coverage, and really um, promote an understanding of, of the ease with which we can move across the city in different ways that uh, reminds us in some cases of the stream quarters that moved through. Then finally, the nature quarters. These were and are based mainly on the historic stream <coughs> quarters and the existing stream quarters, but then many of the tributaries to them that we start to envision as places where we could improve the ecological conditions and start to enhance and restore ecological um, function in these places, allowing for access by humans as well, but thinking of wildlife and how we can we serve them best. Then the nodes, and we had several categories of nodes as well, community nodes, nature nodes, and then existing open space and anchor nodes. The existing open space and anchor nodes, these are all actually existing spaces within the city of Baltimore, but we really found them to be foundational. They are our existing parks, and they are our existing anchor institutions. We are a city that has many universities and colleges of various sizes, and a very robust um, set of hospitals and healthcare institutions across the city. And so we saw them as really important parts of this green network because they are either existing 
very large open space, or they are landowners that have an interesting mission that might either include stewardship, health, or um, a different sort of possibility for maintaining those open spaces and allow for opportunities to apply further green infrastructure on some of those properties that tie into the overall ecological function of the city. Then we identified community nodes, and these are the locations where we highlighted the opportunity for really revitalizing communities and allowing for these spaces, and these are many of these um, different polygons, are locations that have a lot of vacant land, and we see them as the opportunities for economic revitalization, and with that, potentially more residential, more business and commercial, but also really seamlessly integrated green infrastructure, increasing open space, whether it's through extra tree canopy, different sorts of green space that are integrated into the new development, and stormwater management at various scales, to enliven these places that are really modeled for community engagement and social interaction, but also to really infuse it with green space in one way or another amenities. And then there's finally the nature nodes. And these were where we saw the potential for increasing ecological function and expanding upon the existing <coughs> ecological um, resources across the city. Many of them, as you will see, are very close to some of the existing park space or other par uh, forest areas. And some of them are actually um, small forest patches that have been identified by this wonderful nonprofit in the city of Baltimore that's working with community stewards across the city to maintain and help clear of invasive some of these forest patches to promote better ecological function, even in very small scales. So then we start to see how they all link together. So linking the nature corridors and nodes, we start to see how they can build off of one another, connect to one another, and help support one another in function. Linking those, the nature nodes, to the anchor institutions in open space, you just start to see our network kind of grow and, and become more of a network connected. And then finally, we link the community nodes and corridors, and, how, and we start to see how these communities are really able to start accessing across the city east-west, which has been historically a very difficult thing to do as an individual to just move across the city from west to east or east to west is almost impossible. But this envisions a way to reconnect communities and create spaces where they can see revitalization. So all together, this is the final draft plan. As Tom said, we're still in the process of finalizing it, but where we bring it all together and we start to see this network really start to um, evolve the city in a new way and define green space and connectivity for the community. So just briefly, now we, we have starting to see the patterns that we can fill into that box in Baltimore and how do we start to fit an, into the larger green infrastructure network. And it allows us to start thinking outside of the box as well about how Baltimore City can start to connect to the larger green infrastructure, can um, invite people in and out of the city along these corridors perhaps, and embrace ecology in a new and exciting way. And we might even start to see different ways of identifying other parts of the regional health and well-being. These are um, a map we did a number of years ago looking at environmental justice and water quality issues across Baltimore County, just on the outside edges of the city. And if we start to look at the patterns and the overlaps between our Green Network Plan and these past studies, we also see opportunities for improving conditions for all community members and allowing for better and healthier access to our natural resources. Now we'll let Tom wrap it up. All right, that was rapid fire two years of analysis, <laughs> about 15 minutes. So uh, we talked about doing the focus area plans where there were the highest need. Part of the philosophy here was even while we were developing the overall vision, we knew we had to show for decision makers and elected officials and others that we were not just doing a plan that would quote unquote sit on a shelf, but engaging communities on what could be real world projects. So we, we really had to show some change on the ground that we were gonna be leading towards as quickly as possible. Um, here's an example of one of kind of the working maps for one of the focus areas in West Baltimore. And uh, it 
shows in the lighter green what would be some newer green spaces that are in uh, places where there's predominant vacant and abandoned property. So just for instance, this area here, uh, bright green, which is about two blocks, I believe that's somewhere in the neighborhood of about 92% vacant or abandoned property. And there happens to be a uh, beautiful old but vacant red brick uh, school building on the site that we would want to preserve and build around that this new park amenity. And another example is these strips here of green. They're what we're, we call the inner block parks in this old neighborhood called Harlem Park. It's filled with beautiful old re, uh, row houses, many of which are in a state of decay. And behind those beautiful old row houses were what we call in Baltimore alley houses, which was where the help lived. Uh, and in the 60s and 70s, those alley houses were already abandoned and demolished. And this system that was called the inner block parks was created but in the kind of milieu of the 70s, it was predominantly about cement and very, very hard surfaces that would be durable. And over time, they really became nuisance areas that uh, people just, you know, people doing legitimate things were not attracted to them. And as the neighborhood got more and more vacant, um, they were less and less attractive. And, more nasty things happen there from dumping to drug deals and all that. So uh, we looked at uh, taking up the pavement of those old inner block parks that were done in the 70s and recasting them in more of a uh, green mode with stormwater management and working with some nonprofits who had done a couple pilot projects there. And a lot of this process we're doing is really trying to scale up the types of little individual pieces that have been done by various stakeholders and, and really attempt to systematize it more and, and create a blueprint that others can work off of. So here's a quick map of where we identified about six or eight different pilot projects that came out of those focus area plans which were done over a nine to 12 month period with uh, the neighbors. And I'm not going to talk much about the details here, but a lot of it is uh, looking strategically at some of the low hanging fruit, again, where we think we can make an immediate change. And, and much of this, it, it, it's key to understand that it goes beyond just greening. It's really about trying to create assets that can help attract future development. So this is an interesting case, Druid Square, where uh, there's two rows of almost completely vacant row houses uh, bordering this site. And then this large site behind the one row of vacant row houses is almost completely vacant except for a church building. So the original plan was to rehab all the vacant houses, that's what the local CDC wanted to do. And what we came up with in doing the charrette process was, well, there's probably not gonna be enough demand and capacity for people to wanna live in all those houses at one point very quickly. Why don't we take down one side of that and really flesh out this entire square and then target the rehab resources to those row houses across the street so they could be overlooking a really nice urban square and have that be an amenity to attract some homeowners and occupants. Uh, this is the site that I talked about with the red school building and that's 90% vacant and the community really wanted to do sort of attractive more of a passive park with uh, maybe a little informal recreation and gathering space. Um, here's an example of the inner block park. This is an after photo of digging up the cement and creating some new green amenities. And 
one of the key parts that really was attractive to people was placing these big boulders in order to prevent dumping on the site and, and access. But they're also fun things for kids to climb on and just little informal social gathering spots. Uh, here's an interesting pilot where we've worked with a community who uh, one of the residents of this community was uh, the f one of the first uh, <coughs> African-American female firefighters in the city and she tragically lost her life fighting a fire in this part of southwest Baltimore. But the community rallied around an existing open space and wants to create a memorial park in her honor and we were able to uh, help spur this process along and actually get the Black Firefighters Association involved to commit to helping maintain it over time and uh, there's more demolition around here that needs to happen but it, we're really excited about this as one of those very kind of organic projects uh, that are, are truly community based. Uh, here's a, a set of uh, blocks in West Baltimore that are also 85, 90% vacant and it's an area that does not have a lot of recreational facilities and we just yesterday got a, a letter of support from a coalition of communities saying they, they support this project to turn it into some active recreational fields in a spot that doesn't really have access to that. Um, some of our corridor projects include uh, a building off of an exercise path that was built along one of our tragedies over the 60s and 70s, what we call the highway to nowhere in Baltimore. That was one of those great visions of transportation planning in the 50s or 60s. And, uh, when it got to the point after it had decimated a bunch of very nice middle-class African-American neighborhoods by cutting through it, uh, a coalition of folks uh, stopped it from going through one of those major parks in the city. And it just dead-ended. And that's why it's the highway to nowhere where, well, lots of stories behind it, but there is some right-of-way uh, adjacent to that that creates a uh, great spot for an exercise path. The city owns all the property, and there's a little strip of it that's uh, planned now for this exercise path. It's about three or four blocks, but our proposal says, why don't we take it all the way to downtown, which is over here, and then if you go on the other, the other way, about another mile or so, there's a major commuter rail station that's being redeveloped and can we make that kind of connection with our green network plan. Um, this is another example of just building off the momentum of what's in another community plan to, to make a, another connection between downtown and one of the major parks in the city uh, along an existing right of way. And finally, this is that 35 mile rail to trails loop that was referred to earlier. We want our plan to be able to embrace these other initiatives where it makes sense and we can reinforce uh, each other's momentum. About 23 of the 35 miles of this loop already exists. So uh, Rails to Trails at a national level has prioritized this as one of their key projects that they want to do uh, in the United States. So we're excited to partner on that. Uh, Finally, in terms of implementation, I won't spend too much time on this yet, but it may be the most important part of it. Um, again, we, we really want to show uh, pilot projects on the ground, but at the same time, that maintenance issue is, is really, really key. And we're working hard now within city government to try to launch a pilot maintenance project that would accompany our pilot projects and we're, uh, it's, it's a big challenge. There's not enough dollars. DPW, Public Works, is responsible for maintaining everything, but it's a very fragmented system right now. It's all done on a complaint-driven basis. Um, so nobody, you know, until the grass is already a foot tall, um, 
you know, it's already a problem, and that's when it, it finally gets a call. A lot of it's on non-city owned property, so you have to give the property owner 30, 45 days to fix the situation, so by then it's 18 inches tall. Uh, when they don't fix it and DPW goes out once to cut it, but if it happens to be uh, two lots down from a lot owned by recreation and parks or transportation, the DPW guys don't cut it because that's not their purview. They only are cutting that one lot. So it's, there's a lot of work to do on that, suffice it to say. <laughs> uh, we really also want to strengthen the <coughs> partnerships we have with the nonprofits and the stakeholders as well as the community. And uh, when we do major redevelopment projects in the city, which we do have some of those going where we're acquiring large, large sites and offering them through RFPs for redevelopment, we, we want to make sure there's standards in there that really require responding to the Green Network Plan and incorporating some in innovative stormwater management and greening strategies. Um, it's all about connections and we, we want to work on that. There's the, the big projects as well as all of the little brown lines that were on some of those corridors throughout the map we saw on the vision plan are opportunities to build on that low stress biking network that, that was mentioned and help make those connections. Uh, the engagement part is, is just going to have to continue at a very uh, intense level through all of this. So uh, I'm hoping my staff uh, can uh, manage that okay. But we, we have hired a um, assistant director specifically to focus on equity, engagement, and communications for the department. That's the first time we've done that. And there's a big, big equity push. It's a big conversation throughout Baltimore, but it's also a big piece of what our staff really highly values and, and feels like we need to be uh, change makers on. So we're going to be trying to do all that as well. Uh, there's pieces on the process and policy to uh, lots of recommendations to, to fix what seem like little things, but they can be incredible roadblocks. Access to water for community gardens. If you don't have that, you're in, you're in trouble. You're not going to make it work successfully. Um, and things like permitting processes, why put these green, relatively minor greening projects through the same process as you know, a multifamily house has to go through for the permitting? So we're trying to work on ways with other agencies to streamline that. Um, the funding and finance is huge. Uh, we, we need to find extra dedicated sources of revenue for this and we're going to be scouring uh, possibilities and looking with the Trust for Public Land on some case studies. They've done some strategies on how to uh, bring referendums to the voters in various cities. They, they were successful in places like Newark, New Jersey, which is pretty comparable to Baltimore so we, we have to see if there's going to be an appetite for this uh, for the long run but what funded that fantastic Olmsted park system which was uh, a stellar piece was a dedicated transit tax uh, that for years and years and years went into that system but when the streetcars disappeared in the late 50s and early 60s that revenue stream was gone and we've really paid the price uh, of not being able to maintain those great assets. Um, finally, just to say the stage we're at now, we are about in the, in the next four weeks or so to release a final version of the full draft plan and the full vision plan. Uh, we're going to have a, a six-week public comment period on that do some various outreach techniques. We've, we've done lots of big meetings. We're going to do small meetings and conversations, keep our leadership team and advisory teams apprised of things. And once we're finished with that final public feedback, we're going to take it to the Planning Commission for adoption as part to be incorporated in the city's master plan. And things like land use decisions and capital improvement programming can then really uh, 
have to respond to it because it is part of the official city master plan. So I think that wraps us up as far as the formal presentation and here's uh, some contact information for all of us. So.